Welcome back, folks, to the Get a Grip on Letting podcast. On today's show, we have Al Uzinski back for a double take from light, Inside Dot Lighting, talking about the business of lighting, Greg, mergers, acquisitions, what's going on? There's a little bit of that going on, as we all know, and had a good discussion on that topic, where it might be headed in the future and where it was at and everything that goes along with it. Thank you, Al, for coming on the show this episode. But, you know, the most important thing, Greg, is always to do the right thing, right? But if you combine right. it with the light thing, you get Satco, baby. That's S A T C O dot com. They do the light thing. They do the right thing, Greg. And no better indication of that than when you look on their website and the, the link you're seeing right now is they have light bulbs on the top, then they have decorative fixtures, then they have functional fixtures. All right. So what we're seeing there is a functional fixture. But when I look at that, that's a functional decorative fixture because it has trim. How many people do a disc? A lot of people, right? but it's just a white disc. They say, we're going to do a white disc. We're going to do a brushed nickel disc. We're going to do a bronze disc. We're going to make all these different colors. And that's a functional fixture in their mind. That's a decorative in my mind. So they combine the two. They do everything. They do the right thing. They Check do the light out. thing. Come on, man. Go to satco.com. But for anything, do it for the people. Because there's great people down at Satco because I know them personally. So you go to satco.com. Com, baby, and longtime members of the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. That's right. Satco's a member. Premier Lighting with Greg's a member. Atlas Lighting with Michael's a member. Get yourself memorized, associated. But for right now, we got a little episode about mergers and acquisitions coming out at you. Welcome to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast, Al. Thank you, guys. Good to be with you. Say hi to Greg Eric. Hey, Greg. Hi, Al. Thanks for being here. Uh, start off with L. Give us your background. I know you have. What, what do you do right now? What uh, What is your lighting experience? Yeah, currently I'm with Inside Lighting, and we're an online resource for lighting professionals. So we have lots of information about local markets. There's a local markets in North America. So if you want to know who the agent is in Albuquerque for a particular brand, that information's on our website. Um, and before that, I've spent most of my career, which started with. Uh, a major lighting controls company in 1993 uh, working for manufacturers. So um, over the course of a 25 plus year career now, about 17 of them are worth four of the big names that anyone listening to a lighting podcast would probably know and recognize. What, what gave you the idea to start Inside Lighting? You know, years ago um, when I was had sales and marketing management roles, I always had a good feel for who the agents are in various marketplaces. But if my sales were lousy in you know, like a secondary market, I don't know who all the, the agents are in Grand Rapids or Albuquerque or Charlotte. And I always wish that there was like one place you could go to to see who all the, the agents are that, uh, that represent the various lines. And it's publicly av available information, but it was always an Easter egg hunt on the internet. And, and 45 minutes later, you can kind of piece together the market dynamics. So. I created uh, this, this site to, 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 to break down the local markets as well as provide other resources, kind of in a one place uh, epicenter for all that information. And then along the way, I learned that, um, that people don't visit as regularly as you'd want them to, and we're in the business of attracting ad dollars and marketing. So I put uh, relevant news stories on there as well to, uh, to, to keep people updated on the happenings in the lighting industry too. Yeah, I feel like when I've seen your uh, newsletter come in my inbox, it says something about St. Paul, Minnesota. That's where I live. Updates for St. Paul. Is that is that how you do it? You gear it towards where the person is? Yeah, to yeah. You degree? know, I um, well, when 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 I uh, collect the email addresses for um, for the newsletter, I want to uh, take the person's name, first name, last name, company name, and location. Because, um, again, we're in, the, we're in the marketing business when I'm providing an online media. I want to get the person to open that email. I want to get the person to click on the link. So when I put something personal like the first name, the location, in the subject line, that tends to get, that tends to get the reader's attention and uh, therefore leads to higher click rates and, and uh, open rates than, than industry averages would normally dictate. I'll tell you, I like it. I like to know what the hell is going on in my market. When I see that, I'm like, what are you talking about? I should know this. <laughs> it's good. That's right. That's right. That's smart. That's good. Good I want to talk a little bit about agents. Um, yeah. So distributors are not always big fans of agents. There's like a, mm -hmm. um, there could be some friction between distributors and agents. And 
in the last 10 years, this wasn't always this way, okay? In the last 10 years though, um, with the birth of rebates, incentives, upgrades, and projects, so the lighting business became a projects business rather than a lamp re a MRO business for distributors, right? So you go from yes. selling cases of F32 T8s for 276 or 272 or whatever per bulb, you go to like installing you know, high bays and all this kind of stuff. And so there's been some frictions between agents because agents have been going after those end, those, those customers on the, on the, um, the end user customers and distributors and agents have kind of become competitors with one another. And so from a larger perspective, my question would be, how do you see after the 10 years LED boom, that's now probably going to begin to decline as capital preservation kicks in and the crisis mm -hmm. now, how do you see the channel working? Well, a um, couple of things there. I'll first comment on the agent distributor relationships. And first of all, my perspective, I've never been an agent uh, in my roles. I tend to be a partner with the agents as a manufacturer who goes to market through agencies. And I think, you know, when, when a manufacturer goes to market, the agent is, it's the outsourced sales, sales force. Um, you have, factory people who manage those agents and manage the business in those given territories. But in order to get feet on the street, they have a variable cost, obviously, and that's the local agent. And the local agent is, um, it's a valuable part of the overall dynamic. However, to your point, Michael, the, the, the dynamics are changing a bit. Um, a lot of people can get information, readily available information without getting the specification salesperson from the agency to help them. A lot of times people can place an order without the agency salesperson touching it. They can go right to the manufacturer. So the agents have to create value in different ways. And to your point, sometimes the, the distributor's goals are different than the agent's goals. And there's going to be conflict there. And sometimes the, uh, let's just like anything, um, certain distributors have uh, their favorite agents and the, the certain agents have their favorite distributors. And when there's that big school project or uh, building headquarters that's going up and and the, the contractor wants to buy it from a certain distributor, but the, the factory and that distributor don't get along, that creates some, some dynamics. So sometimes you have um, dynamics which cause the agents to, 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 to try to do some things that are contrary to the distributor's best interest as far as steering it towards a different distributor, or, or, or the converse of that is true, where the distributor tries to steer the contractor differently as far as different manufacturers. But uh, in, in, in the case of uh, the channels, we are seeing a lot of different ways that companies um, and users are buying things that, that cut out distribution altogether and um, you know, direct to contractor models or containers of, of cheap and cheerful product that says it's a DLC listed, but may or may not be that end up in Long Beach uh, um, and get distributed throughout California somehow. So there's lots of different ways that, um, that, that, that products are getting to market. And there's a lot of quiet business out there that the, um, that the agents don't even see. And sometimes the distributor doesn't see. And I think that's one of the, you could call it a threat, but you could also call it a, a way for us to, to expand beyond the, the traditional way of doing business and make sure that we're, we're getting our piece of the action and bolstering our, um, our opportunities uh, with, our, with our loyal customers and trying to find customers in other areas too. I think one of the problems with the lighting industry um, or I wouldn't say it's a problem. I think one of the realities of the lighting industry is that the the channel, the paradigm that everyone operated under in 2005 and 1995 is completely gone. And that's yeah. why you see the exiting of these big corporate giants who just cannot, cannot are not nimble enough to switch uh, gears and are not willing to do what they need to do in order to stay relevant in the business. And it was just why you see like, if, if you had to come to somebody and nail the 2002 and say GE Phillips in Sylvania would be sold off and not be in lighting anymore, changing their names and stuff like that, you would have been told you were crazy. Um, you were talking right. about 70% market share for those three or something like that, right? And now, yeah. um, now you're talking about all of them are gone and the paradigm is over and you have the, most manufacturers are actually not manufacturers. They are, they're just, it's a distribution to distribution model where there are distributors who are, bring, um, who are bringing in product from uh, China and selling it to other distributors who are then selling it to the end user. So that's not a strong model because 
-hmm. Manufacturers, what they need, in my opinion, the reason why agents exist and the reason why distribution exists is because manufacturers have a high capital intensive business and they need cash right away. So they want to get paid by a distributor right away for stock as they make it. This distributor holds it. The agent is kind of running around, you know, talking to all the distributors in a market, making sure everyone's stocking that particular manufacturer's products and paying fast. And then distributors sit on it, they hold it, and they take longer terms from end user customers, right? That's what, that's kind of how, why that paradigm existed and why that model existed. Um, the idea of a capital, capital intensive um, uh, manufactured is not realistic anymore. I don't think that exa there exists on the fixture side in some senses, but not, it's not that common on the lamp supply side. Um, do you agree with that? Do you think that's the reason why this has happened? And along with maybe rebates and LEDs accelerating that? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things, and um, I think you had Mark Lean on um, a couple months ago, and one of the things that that, that he acknowledged and that, that uh, I think all of us witnessed is that the, the the change, we all saw the change coming, but but many of us, including some very smart executives for some very large companies, underestimated the speed with which it happened. So the, the transition from traditional sources to LED accelerated in such a way that, um, that, that, that the company's business plans weren't able to to, to be dynamic and nimble enough with these huge multi-billion dollar corporations to do that. And so now here we are to your point um, with, with um, you know, the most recent of the big three that exited the lamp business, GE being sold to a smart home company. Um, and then we of course saw um, Philips do their spinoff and we saw Osram and Sylvania uh, uh, get, get sell their general lighting lamp business to um, MLS and the Chinese conglomerate. So, so you look at those businesses now, which are completely different and I, I think it's there's, there's there's pros and cons of it as well, and I want to turn that question around on you for a moment. When you had that big three, the the, the Philips, GE, Sylvania, fluorescent tube, no one's going to get fired by recommending one of those big three tubes for for their project. But there's also some very good reputable companies that were making tubes that just weren't huge behemoths. So now, as we're seeing um, barriers to entry might be a little lower, we're seeing other names that aren't those former big three companies companies that might not just be as huge. Um, do you see that as a value to your end users, to your contractors, to the lighting distributors like you? What what do you see and perceive when you have now, instead of the menu looking like three or four lamp companies to choose from now, it's a much longer list? I'll take that one first, Greg, and then I'll throw it over to you. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the, the biggest, so it's become a race to the bottom, okay? So the lack of uh, household name brand awareness is, is a difficult thing to overcome in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And so people don't know who company X is. A, an example of this pre-LED would be like eye lighting, Iwasaki lighting, okay? Very high quality Japanese lighting manufacturer. All, like you, you installed an eye brand MR16 made in Japan. That thing never burned out. I put them in my wife's bathroom, parents' bathroom in 1997 and they're still going. 20 watt BAB eye halogens. So um, that would be an example of that. They could never break out of that. So uh, the lack of household name, like people that, hey, it's GE. Oh, it's GE. Okay. Oh, it's Philips. That's premium. It's not premium because the product is premium. It's premium because of the brand promise, which sits within it. Right? There's a brand promise there. Right? The second problem is technical, and that is that the industry lacks clear leadership, companies that are committed to understanding things. I just, um, I just, uh, um, I don't know if it's an amalg amalgamation or it's, a, it's an acquisition. I, I took over a, a company, a guy that has specialty lamps, and, he, and, and he's an older fellow, and he brought in all his catalogs. And I pulled out of the, the pile of catalogs, this Philips catalog on UV lighting. And it was unbelievable. And it was from the 70s. And so much information on how UV lighting worked, how it worked in factories, how it worked in pools, how it worked for water drinking water purification. And I was reading it and reading it and reading it and how it worked for um, uh, <clears throat> air purification and air handlers and stuff like that. It was the most valuable thing I've read in years, in years. Okay, and I'm and I'm sitting here reading this catalog, and they they knew it all in the '70s, and so those big companies can afford to have massive research and development budgets. And when you lack that, and I'm not talking about oh, research and development and lighting is 
you know, 500 million a year or whatever. If it's dispersed over a massive group with no deep roots in lighting, I don't know if that's research and development or kind of finding out what your marketing is going to be. You understand what I'm talking about? And so I think, you know, and I think in manufacturing, when you actually make something, which is why I love talking to LSE on so much, Greg, from TCP, uh-huh. when you're actually talking to someone who knows how a lamp is made, like knows how it's made, um, and can, like I'm, I talked to him, I'm like, this is what the lighting industry needs. You can see him thinking about it. He's like, yeah, we can make that. Yeah, no, no problem. We can do that for sure. And he's thinking about his factory, right? And he's thinking about a factory line that's going to assemble that particular lamp or fixture or whatever. And so I think a lot of that is lost, you know, and, and I love TCP, but you talk to a, a maintenance guy at a, a building and he doesn't know TCP. He doesn't know what that brand is. And sorry, Ellis, but I have to tell him that that's a good brand in lighting. It doesn't go without saying. And so we lose a lot, I think, Greg. What do you, what do you, what's your take? It's good and bad, you know. So first of all, um, we were active in lighting. I've been doing it since 2005. So the big three mattered at one point. And uh, our, my company personally didn't have one of the big three for a while. So we had to go to the second tier. Uh, we tried to get a big three. We eventually did. And by the time we did, it turned into LEDs. So it, it kind of got to the point where I, I had experience dealing with both from the, the point where you couldn't actually get the line or you had to buy it through someone and then to get it and then you get it and then you see the differences and and they needed to change and they didn't so i i think it's something where um you know it's really their fault the big three's fault that that they got to, that lighting got to this point because they didn't move as fast as these other second tier third tier companies did and now it's to the point where those second and third tier companies back when it was fluorescent are now the leaders in led or some of the leaders I consider many of them to be better and bigger than the the big three, um, and more and innovative I, I think, anyway. More innovative, that's for a, sure. Absolutely, easier to work with. You know, all the stuff that mm. as a lighting distributor, somebody selling light bulbs, I need to be that to them. Why couldn't they be that to me? You know, and it, it goes down the line, and it, and it got to the point where I welcomed it. Um, but then there, then you get to a fine line where you welcome too much of it, and there's too many options and and all that. So I don't want too many options, but I wanted more. So Kind of an in between, if that answers it. <laughs> you know, I, I like I like it, and I don't like it. And are your facility people that you deal with, are the the contractors you deal with, are they accepting of these these brands that aren't household names, so long as you and your reputation recommend that it's it's a good brand? Me, are you on it? Uh, you I, go I ahead. Gotta, we both got to, but okay. It, it, it it's uh, yes, if they trust you as a lighting expert, they are. But it's funny to to note it's a it's an age range, and and I don't mean to put anybody down, but there's maintenance people you work with that maybe are fifty plus, and they still care. People that are younger than that don't even know that existed. So you have to you have to ride both lines. But for the most part, it, it doesn't really matter as long as they trust you as a professional. Back to you, Mike. So I, I'm going to comment on that. Um, I think the only brand that matters in lighting is the Design Lights Consortium. I think that is the brand. And I, I, I think their I think their mandate exceeds their ability by a magnitude. And I've said that before. Um, I think that what, what happened was because the utilities took control of the lighting business and um they decided to um uh pursue efficiency at all costs, um what was ha- you know, look, I'm gonna say it flat out. The IES teetered for a while. And look, I love the IES. And, but I mean, in 2016, 2017, people were talking about the IES being irrelevant and not being leaders in lighting. And they changed their management and they changed their mandate and they really have done a great job in the last three or four, three to five years, Greg. I mean, but I mean, they were part of that big three crew that teetered, you know, it was like, whoa, are we going to lose the IES too? Um, and thankfully, they turned it all around. And what a wonderful organization they are. They, they probably always were. But the problem is, I think it all comes back to the utilities pursuing efficiency at all costs. Mm-hmm. Lumens per watt was the only thing that mattered. And the DLC was certifying that. And when what happened was, when that trickled down to the end user, what happened was, I'm getting a rebate. 
It's DL, oh, this DLC thing. People are like, oh, DLC, 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 DLC. DLC means quality. DLC means quality. DLC means quality. And so what happens is I have maintenance guys that know about the DLC. They don't know any lighting brands at all. Well, they'll be like, is it DLC certified? They'll even call in the order desk and ask if something is DLC certified, even when it doesn't yeah. have a rebate attached to it. And so the problem was that the DLC had no interest in, 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 um, in, uh, What's the right word? They had no interest in guaranteeing quality. That wasn't their mandate. Their mandate was <clears> only <throat> to ensure right. lumens per watt. And so right. I think the industry, um, I think that a bunch of different forces moved to make us move too quickly, too soon. And people will disagree with me and that's okay. But I think we adopted LED technology faster than we should have. I think a lot, there's going to be a ton of burned out light fixtures on outdoor lighting. Already are. Yeah, pfft. already are. Detroit's a disaster. All DLC certified, right? All DLC, right. all DLC, right? Yep. But they don't. Yep. They, and then as soon mm -hmm. as it comes, as soon as the uh, the shit hits the fan, oh well, it's not our stuff. We didn't make it. We just we only certified the lumens per watt. And I kicked, you know, I hit the DLC hard here, Al. But I mean, that's what happened. That's not my opinion. I mean, it is my opinion, but it, it's what happened. And um, yeah. and so. We're left without any leaders in the lighting business, and there's emerging leaders now. But you know, so a lot of things going. I've done a lot of podcasts. I've talked to a lot of people, man, and so uh, you know, I, I really think that losing those big three is a tragedy for this for this industry. And yeah, I'm no, there's a sentimental aspect. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm hoping that the new play, no, but can emerge, right? Yeah, yeah, and I'm sorry to step on you there. I think I have a delay on my end. But uh, yeah, there's, there's certainly a sentimental aspect to seeing those, those big three turn into something else. Um, but, you know, there, there was also, um, you know, I'm, I'm older than you guys. And I think, you know, I, when NBC, CBS and, and ABC were the big three networks and then, you know, now there's, there's you know, 142 networks. There's something sentimental about those networks, but, but the other things can be created other opportunities. Um, to go back to the DLC, I think um, your understanding of DLC is, 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 is excellent and, and certainly your comments um, are, are, uh, are thought provoking. The one thing that, um, that I think you touched on, which I agree with, which is there tends to be a false connection that the end user, the customer, that, that someone in the buying chain makes that DLC is certifying quality of product and not simply the performance being what they claim it to be. And I think that's an important distinction that needs to be publicized and, and, and the folks need to be educated better on that because I think it does serve that purpose of the Lumens Hang Pro on, line. hang on. They yes. call yes. their list the quality products list. Are those that's qualified? What, no, it's quality. Qualified. Is it qualified or quality? I think it's qualified. Scott, research it. Google, QPL, QPL. Qualified, qualified product list? list? See, even me, I thought it was quality products list. <laughs> Maybe it is qualified, yeah. Right. So there you go. So, so right. I had in my head. But anyway, um, uh, yes, they, that wasn't their mandate, but it became their mandate, unfortunately, because that's what happened. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting. One of the things that, um, that, that we do at Inside Lighting, uh, we, just, we just published recently a list of um, our, our top 11 most efficient LED troffers. And the first time we did it, we actually pulled information from Lighting Facts. This was back in 2017 when Lighting Facts was relevant. And, um, but now we just pull it from the DLC. And it's interesting to see some of the things there. We have to disqualify certain people because there's a company that they put high bays on there for a tropper category. So, you know, no one wants a tropper that's putting out 20,000 lumens. Um, so, you know, so we did some things to massage it. And we also removed manufacturers that didn't have a presence in, in U.S. or Canada because our constituency for our website is U.S. and Canada. So... I'm not going to just put some, uh, some, some company out of Guangdong or Shenzhen on there because they, they claim to have that. So what I think the lumen per watt designation with the DLC uh, QPL does is it, it, it at least gives that one metric validity versus having some offshore company claim that, hey, we have 180 lumens per watt with a troffer. I know you didn't think that's possible, but believe us, our spec sheet says it's true. Uh, I think the DLC gives that type of at least that portion of the performance the importance, but I think there's so many other reasons: brand uh, reputation, the, uh, the the features, the quality, the the aesthetics of the fixture, the price of the fixture, the local service you get supporting the sale. Um, any company can put out a 10 year warranty, but if they've only been around for 18 months, who cares about a 10 year warranty? So there's so many other things that go into the fixture decision 
Um, and I, I like the fact that DLC is is um, is validating the performance of one aspect, but performance alone, and we put that on our top 11 LED troffer list, the performance alone should not be the sole criteria that people use to make a purchasing decision on a troffer. Yeah, and, and just to step in a little with DLC, I am on the Industry Advisory Council, so I know that they are focusing on trying to make quality a, a factor. And, and what I've always said is, okay, the product is one thing, but go to the company, qualify the company, make sure they're good, yes. and then look at the product. Start there. There's a company, somebody I would buy from, somebody I would trust, somebody I'm, I'm good with what they're going to develop, and then I look at the product. Then you can have a qualified list, in my opinion. How do you do that? I don't know. Hallelujah. I'm just telling them to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, we, you know, you have the... Uh... You have these accreditation agents, and you know what? Like, I, I love the people at the DLC, and I'm not trying to criticize them, but I, yeah. I see a lot of holes in that that have caused trouble. Um, you know, how do you, Al? How do you feel about the? Um, I know you wrote it as a question here, but is there going to be an ascendancy here um, from di like some brands emerging as uh, champions as a to capture market share? Or you, do you think it's going to be balkanized for a while? Are we discussing lamps yeah, or just, yeah. just fixtures in general? Yeah, LED lighting leaders. Yeah, I think um, I think we've seen that over the years. Um, I remember competing against Focal Point in the early 2000s, and they really weren't on my radar, but I heard a little bit about them. But then, gosh darn it, people started falling in love with Focal Point, and somehow they could compete with the high-end persnickety lighting designer crowd that wanted some, some awesome-looking flange and reflector. And then they could also compete on price for some of the the more standard type products. And now Focal Point turned into you know, a pretty major entity, of course, that was just recently acquired last year. And, and more recently, you see companies that, that start from scratch, a uh, company uh, like, like Lumen Pulse that, um, that started way later than Color Kinetics did, but entered their space. And if you look at the, uh, the financials that they had when they, um, when they turned into a public company, they, they since went private. I mean, the ramp up was enormous. And you look at the way that they if you're starting a company now that doesn't have traditional product and traditional shapes and traditional channels as part of your history, and you can blank slate um, a new way to go to market with your new product line, you can find your niche and expose that. So there's, there might be companies that, that, that aren't on our radar now in 2020 that we're talking about as fast up and comers or maybe you know, large entities uh, three, four, five years from now. So I think that's definitely possible. Barriers to entry are lower. Technology enables more people to enter. And I think it'll be interesting to see what type of uh, what, what type of categories are launched by new companies that that cause some of this growth that we've seen with some of these other examples I shared. Do you think the uh, mergers and acquisitions are going to are going to ramp up, or are they kind of steadying out? In your opinion? Well, look, I um, I'm no merger and acquisition expert, but I I am a fan, and I have followed them uh, since the late '90s when a lot of those linear fluorescent companies were being purchased, which changed the dynamics. To answer your question, I think um, right now, if you, if you think about what goes into uh, a merger acquisition discussion, um, you know, a lot of dynamics go into it. But one of the major points that the two companies have to uh, discuss and, and, and come to some sort of commonality on is the, the valuation of the company. And evaluating a company's value right now is really hard given the, the pandemic's effect on the economy. Um, I think Acuity Lighting, Acuity Brands, uh, their, um, their fiscal year ends August 31st. And before this pandemic hit, they were on pace. They were straight lining to a pace of be a $4 billion lighting company. And then, of course, um, this hits, and now it's projected that they probably won't get to that $4 billion mark. But you look at a much smaller company who um, was also affected by this, um, and, and is their valuation going to be accurate? And would a, would a potential suitor want to preserve that capital rather than pay too much for that, that company? So um, I don't have a crystal ball, but I would imagine that this pandemic is stalling those negotiations because valuations might be out of whack. But sometimes if you have a private company or a, a, a division of a, a, some sort of public company or a large company that just needs to acquire assets, um, you know, sometimes people make those acquisitions despite the the conventional wisdom on what the valuation is. So um, I think this this pandemic will cause a pause, but um, you know, crazy things happen sometimes that uh, come out of nowhere. I got one more comment, and um, get your get your thoughts on see what you what you think. And I got to kind of open it up a little bit. 
I took a course yeah. at a nailed convention by a guy named Al Bates. Remember that? I remember Al Bates Profit Planning Group, I think his name is his company. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. one of the principles he was talking about was you find out what your core competency is. And then anything that's not related to your core competency, any cost, you try to turn it into a variable cost. So you can buy it when you need it, right? So variable cost is better than fixed costs, right? So you don't want a lot of fixed costs. You want, you want to be able to buy stuff when you need it. What's interesting, I think what's happened to the lighting business, and I think this is going to reverse with America's relation to increasing tensions with China. I think what you're going to see is you're going to see right, what, what happened in the lighting business is you could buy lighting factory space as you needed it, right? So you could buy lighting factory production when you wanted it and only have it when you wanted it for less, a lot less than the, the capital required to build a lighting factory, okay? So what happens is you have all these new manufacturers, manufacturers coming up who are renting, who are outsourcing the competency of making lighting. Okay. Right. They're outsourcing it to a factory in China, perhaps sharing some secrets with them or whatever, but then they're outsourcing it, which is why a lot of the lamps look the same actually. And uh, a lot of them are coming out of the same factories. And so they're outsourcing that and they're turning their fixed, a very heavy fixed cost of starting a factory and producing lamps or having materials coming in and the staff required and the, the research and the technical staff and the engineers. And they outsourced all of that because it wasn't their core competency. And I think that, I think that's going to reverse. Or do you have any thoughts on that or any, any ideas on that? Well, I, I, I understand what you're saying about the, um, the variable costs and, and being able to, to, to have that Chinese factory example, the elastic with the demand that that manufacturer has. Um, I think it'll be interesting to watch the Asian factories that are, that are servicing as a third party contractor, some of these North American manufacturers. It'll be interesting to see them perhaps the manufacturers may diversify their manufacturing outside of China. Um, there's a move to, to, to manufacture in other low cost countries. We might see more of it come to Mexico, which is a place that, that obviously a lot of North American manufacturers already have a presence in. But you look at Vietnam as emerging as one of those areas where the cost to assemble cost of labor uh, is similar to that of China. And now you can have, um, you know, maybe more insulation from some of the, the socioeconomic or geopolitical uh, conflict that could happen and impact trade. And now it's in, in, in Vietnam. But I think the, um, the overall aspect of it, I think, yeah, we're going to see supply chain get very creative uh, to your comment, Michael, about how they outsource, how they utilize and, uh, and use their, their manufacturing and, um, and, and deploy accordingly. And it, what's going to be hard is, is I think, forecasting, sales forecasting is hard right now and it's going to continue to be hard um, for the foreseeable future. So, so those orders, uh, there might be piles of inventory in, in one case for certain product categories and there might be 12 week lead times on others because we're going to have a forecasting issue, I think, that, that's, that's creating inventory irregularities of, of surplus or, or, or shortages. Al, thanks for being a guest on the Get a Grip on Lending podcast. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yo, Greg, it's Light Thing. It's Right Thing. It's S A T C O dot com, baby. Satco dot com. Surprisingly, to a lot of people, uh, the look of the light fixture matters, right? Now, they shouldn't all look the same, and Satco makes sure that they give you options, they give you colors, they give you trims, they give you sizes. You know, we're talking about an LED desk right now. That's one of their thousands of products that they have. But of that product alone, they have different sizes, different shapes, different colors. They're doing the right thing. They're doing the light right thing. thing. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, get excited. You know why? I get excited about this. People say, oh, da, da, da. no, I'm excited to talk about Satco. I'm excited to talk mm-hmm. about that company. They have great products, especially if you're an electrical distributor and you want to reduce your line, you're a lighting distributor, you want to add a, an element. Satco's got everything, man. You got to go to satco.com, light thing, right thing. Come on, baby. Members of Nailed. Who, by the way, about Nailed. You got to join now. My, my, my advice to you, listener, is to sign up for Nailed right now. Don't wait. That's right. Pull your car over. Take off your COVID mask. Okay? Go to naild.org. 
send Bree Gurman a say I want to just send an email info at nil.org. I want to join. We'll get you all set up. And uh, of course, Al Zinski inside dot lighting. Greg, what a great what a great interview. Yeah, good guy to talk to, and we, that was our second one. I'm sure there's going to be more to come down the road. Thank you. You know, from my heart, I'm very grateful to all you that listen to this podcast. Super grateful and humbled, by the way. Thanks for listening. Written on the rectory wall, there's a sign there for all. You are lost, Lord is there to find you.